Let's open in a word of prayer. Lord, we do lift your name on high. You are the point of why we gather. You are the reason that we exist. You are who we come here to hear from. And so that's indeed what I would pray, that you would fill me with you, your presence, your spirit, that you would purge me of any sin, my own opinions even, that you would speak forth which is right and true, and that your people would be receiving what it is from you, that they would uh, be alert, attentive uh, to what it is that you want to communicate to them this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we are in a very critical chapter. So there are several chapters in the Bible that you really need to know where they are and their purpose. And this is one of them. Acts chapter 2 is a very important chapter. Um, Acts chapter 10 is a very important chapter. If you don't know what's in those passages and why they're important, it might be good to write that down and go back and kind of study what is important about Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 15 is one of the most important chapters in the Bible because it answers a very, very, very important question, which we'll get to in a minute. It is the first ecumenical, if you will, council of churches where God is working through the human elements of the apostles and the elders to come up with a doctrinal position, one that is this way and not this way. And as I mentioned, uh, the Council of Nicaea was one of those. Council of Chalcedon is one of those. We have had seven councils. And unfortunately, the church is so divided, I doubt we'll ever have a council again to decide doctrinal questions because their denominations decide different things, but as the Methodists, the Presbyterians, and everybody all getting together, it's sad that that probably will never, ever happen again. The issue that is being addressed already, so the, there's one main issue that's being addressed in two side issues. The entrance of Gentiles into the church has always been something that was around, but they've never, ever, ever been on equal footing with Jews. They were not second class in God's eyes, but you couldn't, as a Gentile, you couldn't go into the Holy of Holies. You couldn't go into the Holy Place. There was an outer court called the Court of the Gentiles. You couldn't even go into the innermost court as a Gentile. So there was always this separation between God's definite people, the nation of Israel, and Gentiles. And again, he always wanted to save what we would call Gentiles, but never on equal footing until one of the last chapters in Acts where the Holy Spirit, that's Acts chapter 10, in case you're wondering, comes upon Gentiles in the same way that they come upon the apostles. It's also important for us to know, if you remember, we just got back from Paul's first discipling journey, and that was in the region of Galatia. And that's important, so between Acts chapter 14 and Acts chapter 15, I believe that the letter of Galatians was written. So he just went through the churches, and you already saw Galatia is a region so there isn't one location, it's uh, several cities, so he's writing to those several cities. And the reason that I believe the dating of the book of Galatians happens before 15 is because Paul never mentions the Jerusalem council, and he's dealing with the same topics. And uh, In fact, Acts 15 is so important, it is how we date most of Paul's letters, mentioning or not mentioning this big moment in this Jerusalem council. So again, this is a very important chapter, a big deal. And it starts with the central question in verse 1. Some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. 
So as I said, this is the most important question that you and I will face in our time here on planet Earth. What must I do to get into heaven? That's what this question is addressing. And there are some, now you have to remember, they are so attached to the law. For 1,500 years they've been following the law. And so doing the same thing the same way for 1,500 years, you can see it's very difficult to let go of what you've been doing for 1,500 years. And so they think that the only way, sure, you can believe in the Messiah, Jesus, but you also must be circumcised according to the law and follow the law. Um, and again, this is a critical issue. And unfortunately today, I don't think Satan has to work this hard to divide churches or denominations. The issue of salvation. He can divide a church over the color of a carpet, the style of music. Um, unfortunately, we are a lot more maybe fickle than the early church was. So 15 years after Jesus ascended into heaven, Acts chapter 15 is written. This is, the, again, the first issue that they're dealing with that is having reverberating effects throughout all of the region. They're going to establish a formal doctrine. And here's the side questions. Can the Gentiles be on equal standing? And how does the law of Moses apply to a believer when they're saved? That's really what the Jerusalem Council was coming together to address. And it's interesting, in 1786, William Carey laid the burden of world missions before a ministerial meeting in Northampton, England. And one of the leaders of that told him, and this again, the point is how hard it is for us to change mindsets or transition. He said, young man, sit down. When God pleases to convert the heathen, he will do it without your aid or without mine. So he did not obviously want William Carey to go convert. He was going to India to convert the heathens. And just thinking about that, if he had listened to his leaders, we wouldn't have uh, a pretty big, well-known name. He went to Calcutta. He formed... Uh, a British, British in Indian territory and non baptist Christian missionaries. And again, many people came to faith as a result of him being willing to think in a different way and outside of the box. He's known as the father of modern missions and then wrote a scathing uh, letter back an inquiry into the obligations of Christians to use means for the conversion of heathens and founding the Missionary Baptist Society. So, Acts chapter 15. Some men come down from Judea and were teaching the brothers. Now, we don't, we're going to call these unbelievers, these Judaizers, because it doesn't say they were saved. So, some men, we're going to call them unsaved, came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. After Paul and Barnabas had no small discussion and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others then were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles. So they're starting to spread this message that the Gentiles are going to have some equal footing and brought great joy to all the brothers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. So, again, without the authorization of the Jerusalem church, these Judaizers, these self-appointed guardians of truth, are now teaching the Antioch believers, so they're in northern territory in Antioch, and they're teaching them theology that you must be circumcised to be saved. We even think that they were probably refusing to eat with the Gentile believers. Uh, we see this in the letter of Galatia. Paul, the apostle, uh, opposes Peter. Peter gets involved in this where 
he's acting one way when the Jewish brothers show up and another way when they leave. This would be like you and I if we were had a, a, a racist family member and, and when our black friends came over to our house um, and you looked at your neighbor who you knew was racist, you didn't associate, didn't talk with them, didn't have anything to do with your black neighbor, and then when your racist family members leave, all of a sudden you're back on good terms with them. So this is what was going on with the Apostle Peter. He got caught up in this acting one way, people pleasing, if you will, towards one group, towards the other. And so Paul and Barnabas are involved in really the, the key pushers and movers in here. But one of the things that I want you to notice, and again, we're constantly asking, I hope, the question, what is the church doing? What is in it for us? What does it mean for us? One of the things that I want you to notice is that the role of elder is firmly established in this newly formed Christian faith. If you remember, elders were a part of the Jewish tradition. But now we're seeing this role, because in verse 4 it tells you when they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church, the apostles, and the elders. So we have a very established role that moves from Judaism to Christianity, and that is the role of the elders. The other thing that I want you to notice, it's not a point, but they're not, again, I mentioned this last time, they're not voting, they're not going to the congregation and saying, you know, what do you think, what do you think? It's not that kind of an ecumenical thing. But they are deciding doctrinal issues, and they are well-adversed in the scriptures, and it is a plurality. It's the brothers, the elders, and the apostles. They're not dictating from one person. It's a group deciding, learning, and knowing the scriptures, and deciding in doctrinal matters. Then, we also notice that in verse 3, as they're going, and this is very important, as they're traveling, they are using every opportunity to teach and to evangelize. Verse 3 says, being sent on their way by the church, they pass through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles. So as they're going and traveling about, they're always, whether they're at Walmarts, whether they're at the river stop, whether they're at a wedding, whether they're at a baseball game, whatever they're doing, they're advancing the gospel. And again, I wasn't, forgot to ask Don Rowe for permission to share this illustration. Can I share an illustration about Mark and when you came over? Okay, so just as an example, on Monday, Don Rowe, who is Jesus with skin on for this gentleman named Mark. Mark had a stroke. Um, and Don was the only person there for him. In fact, he went to this hospital so that Don could be there to take care of him. Um, and so, again, he's being just Jesus with skin on. He brings him over uh, on Monday to actually converse with Levi about coins. And so I engage in a conversation with him, and I just ask him, start fishing. I ask him about how this has impacted his faith um, and how his medical challenges might help prepare him for eternity. And then before he left, I prayed for him. And I was really surprised that he said, I was the first person to pray for him since he's been out of the hospital. And so I'm thinking, I wonder, again, how many Christians he may have encountered along the way. So whether we're meeting with friends, whether we're someone brings over, again, we need to be fishing for the souls of men. And again, the reason I call it fishing is if, if they're not biting, if he's not responsive, which he wasn't really terribly responsive, then I'm not going to thump the Bible over his head and say, you're a sinner, you're headed to hell. Um, you're going to die right now from your issues. Um, I'm trying to present Jesus and get him to know Jesus, not dealing with controversial issues. So this became a discussion at our elders meeting, and I just need you to know that we're thinking about and want you to be thinking about all the time with all of your friends and family, um, acquaintances, co-workers, how you can bridge those conversations into the gospel. You've noticed that the early church is doing that. And if they had not done that, 
you probably wouldn't. Can you imagine if they only just shared one person and kind of just stayed in their little holy huddle and they didn't start evangelizing and sharing the gospel? We wouldn't have the faith we have. So again, I just want to continue to encourage you to share the gospel no matter where you are. And again, I keep mentioning a wedding because maybe you don't know Shane and Erica uh, Wibbles got married last night. Uh, you could have come and you could have seen Randy and Carla doing the boogie. They were shaking down or uh, Doug and Carrie. So it was a sight to behold for certain all of us dancing. Oh, no, we weren't really dancing. We were just moving. We were exercising. That's what we call it. Verse 5, some believers who belong to the party of the Pharisees. Now notice, believing Pharisees. Some believers who were Pharisees. That's important. Rose up and said, well, is it necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses? So, I want to break the Jerusalem Council down into four movements, if you will. And verse 5 is the first one. We'll see the Pharisees, believing Pharisees, rising up and agreeing with the Judaizers of verses 1 through 3. And so they're like, hey, that sounds good to me. We've been trained in the law, obeying the law of Moses, being circumcised. Seems like a reasonable thing to do. And again, I don't know if you think that believing Pharisees is an oxymoron or not. Uh, but if you remember, Paul was a Pharisee, so it's very possible for Pharisees to cross that line and become saved. So the bottom line is, do we add anything or something to salvation? And we like this, right? We like to take credit for something. If I invite you over to my house for dinner, what's your inclination? To return? Well, some of you are like, no, just take it. <clears throat> Generally speaking, we want to pay back. We don't like to owe anyone anything in that sense. So if you invite me over, I feel obligated to invite you back over. Or if you get me a gift, I feel compelled. Like we want to have some part in even our salvation. There's got to be something we can take credit for, some way we can give back or participate or earn or some way. So again, I believe that Jesus died for me, but now i got to be circumcised. There's got to be something I can do. And one commentary, Lenski writes it this way. To add anything to Christ as being necessary to salvation, say circumcision or any human work of any kind, is to deny that Christ is a complete Savior. It is to put something human on par with him. And this is fatal, he says, a bridge to heaven that is built 99 out of 100 of Christ and even one one hundredth of any human breaks down at the joint and ceases to be a bridge. Even if Christ be brought to carry us 999 miles and we're responsible for the last mile, would leave us hanging in the air with heaven, and yet it would still be far away. So, again, the Pharisees already believed the law, and so that sounded good to them. So that's our first movement. The Pharisees rise up. They propose, let's call this an elders meeting. One of the people standing says, I propose that we make circumcision necessary, and they need to obey the law. So the Apostle Peter responds, and he stands up and says, As the apostles and elders were gathered, after this head man had much debate, Peter stood up and said, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Acts chapter 10. That's why that's so important. This is where that happened. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did us. If you remember in Acts chapter 10, he's not even done with his sermon. He's not even finished in saying amen. And the Holy Spirit, in the middle of his sermon, falls upon the Gentiles, and he sees visible manifestations of the Spirit in them. 
And so that's what he's talking about. And he, God, made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why are you, or us, putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples? Again, this is another side note. Notice they're not called believers. There's no distinction in the Bible between a disciple and a believer. All believers are disciples of Christ. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test and placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? That's a very interesting. We have not even been able to follow the law. Why are we going to ask them to follow the law? But we believe that we will be saved. And here it is. Good doctrinal answer to how the law relates or anything else. That we are saved through grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, just as they will. So, again, the first thing I want to mention here is that God firmly established a witness among the Gentiles. And if you're taking notes, Acts chapter 10, that's where that happened. And Peter is talking about it right now. God made a choice that Peter should preach the gospel just as Jesus had given the king keys of the kingdom to Peter and he used them to open the door to the faith of the Jews and the Samaritans and then in Acts chapter 10 to the Gentiles. And Peter made it clear to Cornelius and his household that they were saved by hearing and believing, not by obeying the law. He didn't even add any of that. God gave the Holy Spirit to the Gentiles, which most of us are, to bear witness that we are born again and only God can see the heart and knew that these men, these Gentiles and children, whatever age they were, were saved. God also erased in this moment a distinction that for centuries had been held between Jews and Gentiles. And I even wonder for us, I mean, how hard it is for us in our American history to separate some of the cultural differences between Caucasians and African Americans or Hispanics or whoever we think is not on par with us. And it is. It's a difficult journey if we've always been told Jews are better than Gentiles. We have entrance. They can't come in where we can. They can't do what we can. But God is erasing the differences in the kingdom. And fourth, Peter mentions, and this is his strongest statement, that removing the yoke of the law, because they can't even carry out the burden of the yoke of the law. The law never was meant to purify you. It was never meant to save you. It was meant to reveal sin to you so that you could turn to God and be saved. Verse 12, then, this is the third movement, they fell silent. Hmm. Think about that. And then they listen to Barnabas and Paul. Also notice who's listed first, because it's about to change. Barnabas and Paul. But then it will become Paul and Barnabas. You'll see that shift in Luke's intentionality. So as they listened to Barnabas and Saul, as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. Now, what were the signs and wonders that were done among the Gentiles? They were saved. I don't know if you realize this, but you crossing the line of faith is a miracle. It is a sign and a wonder. That's mainly what happened in Acts chapter 13 and 14. We did see one blind man get saved, but it says signs and wonders, and most of it is the Holy Spirit coming upon Gentiles. So God proved his witness among the Gentiles with signs and wonders. And I was talking to even to Matt after the elders meeting. I, I just would love to have some signs and wonders happen. I'd love to be able to just convince you that God is in our midst, blessing our church. Lucas, walk in here and speak and testify to the wonder of Jesus. And then you watch him walk up here and start talking. Would your jaw drop? I would hope it would, because that would be a bona fide divine miracle. No one could 
question it, no doubt about it. You couldn't say a doctor did it. You couldn't credit anybody else but God in healing if that little boy got up out of that wheelchair and started to, in fact, we might even allow dancing in here if he could go around and dance. That boy could get out of that wheelchair. Do we pray for stuff like that? I do. I hope you do. I hope we're praying for cancer to be healed. We don't, I mean, doctors are valuable, but we already know they're not absolute. They're not, science isn't black and white as much as we think it is. It's the practice of science. So yes, we go to doctors, and yes, we hope that God does wonderful things through stem implants and all kinds of other things, but at the end of the day, God needs to touch us in a particular way, and I pray that he will continue to do that in our midst. But the greatest miracle is those who are crossing that line of faith and becoming children of God. That is the miracle that we need to talk about the most, praise God for the most, and that's why it's so important for us to share the gospel with others. Um, and again, one of the things that I want to encourage you, I, I really don't like it when I hear somebody give a testimony and they get up and they say something like this. They're like, you know, my testimony isn't very exciting. I've been a Christian most of my life. I followed Jesus from a wee age of five years old. And my, my testimony is born. What? Because I'm a high school dropout and a drug dealer? That's what you want for your children? That's a greater testimony to me, the fact that you were raised in a godly home, that God gave you godly parents, that he opened your eyes at an early age, that he sustained you through middle school and high school into your adult years, that he allowed you to, to go all that time without being drawn into drugs, without being drawn into all the world offers. To me, that's an exciting testimony. And again, we seem to love the testimonies that are of the losers who are in jail and how are now giving a witness for Christ. But to me, again, I think it's quite a miracle to have someone be in a godly home and being raised. So never minimize your testimony and what God has done for you. Amen? Amen. That should be an amen for sure. So finally this morning, James is the final one to speak in this Jerusalem. The apostle, this is not that brother of John. He was killed already, if you remember, in Acts chapter 12. This is James, the brother of Jesus, who has now become a believer, a prominent leader in the Jerusalem church. He is also most likely the author of the book of James, the brother of Jesus, not the apostle, James, which was, by the way, also probably written before this council took place. But here's why that's important. The fact that, again, someone in his family close to him, uh, seen as he has seen him grow up, uh, is now crossed the line of faith, gives further evidence he gives his testimony. And the other reason it's important to know is if you read the content of the book of James, you will know that James, of all the New Testament writers, was very heavy on the doing. The book of James has more imperatives in it than any other New Testament book. So if there's ever going to be a guy to give testimony to the law or to doing, it's the brother of Jesus, James, because he's so ingrained in the Dewey that grace seems to be lacking in his author. So I imagine when he speaks, the Judaizers are thinking, yes, we know James is on our side. And so James speaks. All the assembly fell silent. They listened to Barnabas, Saul, relate. And after they finished speaking, James replied, brothers, listen to me. Simeon, who is Peter, has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take from them a people for his name. And with this, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. After this, I will return, and I will rebuild the tent of David, that is the people of God, that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins, and I will restore it, that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord, and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from old. So 
They're probably surprised. Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols and from sexual immorality and from what has been strangled and from blood. For from ancient generations, Moses has in every city those who proclaim him, for he is already read in the Sabbath in the synagogues. Now, I want to comment real briefly on the fact that we don't hear James say this is necessary for salvation. And I was just curious, how many of you in here know whether your meat is strangled or not? I know a few of you do because you're probably out there doing it. But most of us in here don't know the means by which the cow that we're eating, the bird that we're eating is strangled. So, you know, again, we even think about this ecumenical council and what is said um, as advice. Does it say it's necessary for salvation? It's going to be strange to us because we're not going to know these things. So that's why, again, I'm not saying it's not inspired, but uh, it gets further updated, if you will, as it relates. All right, so the key idea in James' speech is agreement. Here is what he's saying. There is a place for Gentiles and Jews side by side in God's kingdom. He is in agreement with Peter that God was saving Gentiles by Grace, And he says, the prophets agree. Uh, and again, I think the Judaizers probably got excited at this point. Uh, but James goes on and says, well, now that's, they agree that they would be saved and saved by grace through faith. And he quotes Amos 9 through 11. And again, this is one of those passages that if you're going to go to a website where it says the Bible contradicts itself, you're probably going to find this verse. And the reason that you're going to find this verse there, uh, my niece is going through these passages with me to tell me that the Bible contradicts itself. But the reason is, is because it's not quoted verbatim. If you go to Amos 9, you're going to see, you compare the two, they don't match up word for word as well as the Septuagint doesn't match up word for word. And the reason that I think that is, is in one word, prophets agree. I think James, he didn't say the prophet Amos, said, he says the prophets agree, and I think he's summarizing the ideas in Amos 9, in Isaiah, and other places that basically, he's definitely taking this quotation from Amos but the point is, is that he's saying there is room for Gentiles and Jews side by side in God's kingdom. We'll see this played out in Romans and other places. It'll have more detail. Amos also prophesied that the fallen tent, which is the people of God, would be raised up and God would fulfill his covenant with David. And that king would sit on the throne. That future king is, of course, Jesus Christ, that son of David. So the only Jew alive today who can prove his genealogy and defend his kingship would be King Jesus. And so the conclusion, therefore, is, is that they are saved by grace through faith. We're not going to put the burden of the law, the burden of circumcision on them. Therefore, it's not upon you either. And then we have that statement and summary. Salvation is by faith in Jesus Christ, by faith through, oops, that was supposed to be grace. My apologies. Then I need to explain one more word. Salvation is by faith in Jesus Christ through grace with proven faith. Why do I say proven faith? And I think the answer, this is what you can summarize. We should write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols. In other words, that there has always been in the mind of God, and especially in James with all his imperatives, but this is true of the whole counsel of Scripture, that those who are saved show themselves to be saved by the fruit that is in their lives. So a prayer said in... VBS or Awana in 1912 
with no evidence of salvation or fruit would be of cause of concern uh, and should be. So that is true. That's, it is a proven faith. We demonstrate. I'm not a drug, just in case you're wondering, I'm not a drug dealer anymore. Um, I don't do the things, most of them, that I did before. Um, I do listen to Metallica once in a while when I'm working out. A couple of you are like, who's Metallica? That's all right. Don't look them up. Um, your whole view of me will change after that. But the point is, is yes, there should be evidence that we're not the same as we were. And by the way, this should be true as we, you know, I don't know what the difference between uh, a 75-year-old artist and an 84-year-old artist are, or a 75-year-old Don and a 92-year-old Don, but even as you get more immature, there still should be growth in grace. There still should be things that um, the Lord is doing because you're not home yet. You're not glorified yet. So there are things in you that should be true of all of us. We should see evidence of our salvation. But know that all of that is by faith through grace. And that's why this morning we're going to close by seeing a grace that is greater than all of our sin. So let's close it in prayer.